Yes, um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, dear friends, I uh, thank you for joining this webinar and you're very welcome. My name is Brian Nyunga, I'm from Uganda, but I'm uh, joining the call from Nairobi in Kenya. I'm a member of the World Council of Churches Executive Committee and today I'm grateful to God that I'm uh, privileged to be the moderator of this webinar entitled Faith Communities in the HIV and AIDS Response Today. Uh, the objective of today's session, friends, is to receive uh, an update of the HIV response in the World Council of Churches and its HMN co-partners around the globe. We shall be looking at the strategies that have been implemented and the way forward. But before we start, uh, I'd like to provide us with some logistic guidance. To begin with, please uh, make sure that your microphone is muted unless you are called upon uh, to speak. So please ensure that you mute your microphone so that we communicate very well. Uh, I request you to use the chat to introduce yourself. Please tell us who you are and where you're joining from. And if the presentations are going on and you have a question, please feel free to post that question in the chat. It could be also a comment, so whatever I want to say during the session, please post it in the chat. But don't forget to introduce yourself and tell us where you're coming from. Uh, to begin with, uh, to begin with, I will, uh, we are going to have an opening prayer led by Carol Finley from the Church of Scotland. And fortunately, our sister is not able to join us live, but I thank God uh, she sent us a video and I request communications to uh, play for us the video as we pray. Let us pray. God, we read in your word that you gather all nations before you. You look to us, Lord, to be people of nations who have hearts for justice, justice for all people, but particularly those oppressed and vulnerable. You want the voiceless to be given a stage, the hungry to have enough to eat, and all to be treated fairly. Help us, God, to address the root causes of poverty, of injustice, of stigma and discrimination, to seek to break the systemic inequality, unequal power and injustices of whole nations. Today on World AIDS Day, God, help us to find time to reflect and remember the 40.1 million people who have already died because of HIV and AIDS. We call their names out loud. Let them be remembered. Each name, a son, a daughter, a mother, a father, a relative, a neighbour, a friend or a lover. Nearly all have died too early, too young. Each one is a child of God, loved and remembered. We call out now the names of our loved ones. Martha, Nigel, Mr. Magawa, Omar, Asia, Mercy, Jimmy. We remember them. God, we pray for the millions who are living with HIV. We pray for governments, multinational organisations, scientists, faith-based organisations and community groups, and others who continue to work to bring an end to new infections and to fight stigma and discrimination. With grateful hearts, we give thanks that you love us unconditionally, even when we become part of a system full of judgment and blame. Help us to be brave as we fight to change the structures so that the nations of the world reach out to all with Christ-like care and compassion. Help us to build nations which are mirrors of heaven and where all can live with dignity and worth. 
Amen. And now, friends, uh, without wasting time, we'll uh, move straight into our next session. And in this session, we are going to hear uh, on uh, the importance of HIV in the global development agenda and in the World Council of Churches. Uh, speaking to us is going to be Professor Isabel Apao Philly, who is the Deputy General Secretary in the World Council of Churches. Professor Isabel is an African theologian deeply committed to the HIV response and to gender equality. She oversees the HIV work in WCC, and I'm proud to be one of her students. So, Prof, you're welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. Good afternoon, or good morning, or good day to everyone. I'm joining from Geneva. Today, we commemorate World AIDS Day. I'll give, I'll give initial remarks explaining why HIV remains an important topic in the development agenda and in the World Council of Churches. The focused work on health in the BCC began in 1968 with the formation of the Christian Medical Commission in 1968. The CMC assisted in the reorientation of the church's health care to be involved into a more comprehensive and community-oriented service. This led to WCC's close working relationship with the, World Council, with the World Health Organization in Geneva from 1974. It is in this context of ongoing official relationship with WCC that the WHO asked the WCC in 1983 to raise awareness among the churches regarding the emerging disease called AIDS. HIV has been a critical issue for the ecumenical movement since then over the last 40 years. Currently in WCC, we have two initiatives working on HIV. You know, first, we have the ecumenical HIV initiatives and advocacy with the aim with the main purpose of creating HIV competent churches and the theological institutions. This initiative started in 2002. This work has had tremendous influence and success across wow. Africa. And hence in 2013, in our 10th assembly in Busan, the WCC was, uh, made a decision to expand this work to other continents. The second initiative is the Ecumenical Advocacy Alliance, which has two campaigns. One is on HIV and the other one is on food. The EAA started in 2000 with, within the WCC and went out to be on its own and came back to the WCC in 2015. Its focus has been global advocacy uh, within the United Nations agencies. My colleagues, Manoj and Gracia, will share more information about uh, the work of EHIA and EAA within the WCC. Then came COVID pandemic in 2020, which raised new health challenges. With this pandemic, we saw the resurgence of inequalities, stigma, and discrimination that we thought we had dealt with you know, during the time of HIV and it was done. The latest epidemiological data from UNAIDS tell us about multiple collapsing of crises 
we are facing today, humanitarian, economic, and health crisis, which had knocked back the global HIV response and seriously affected people living with HIV and the most affected populations. This means resources have reduced, inequalities have widened, and we face millions of AIDS-related deaths and an increase in new infections. This is why the HIV remains an important issue in the development agenda and in the work of the World Council of Churches. We want to reaffirm our commitment to the HIV response. This is an issue of justice and compassion. We acknowledge that the membership of our churches is affected with this epidemic. As we look forward in the WCC, especially after our 11th assembly, which took place in August and September this year, the WCC governing bodies have approved the formation of a commission of the churches on health and healing. Within this commission, there will be a working group with a focus on HIV. We will harvest the lessons we have learned from decades of working on HIV and apply them to other pandemics. We expect the Commission of the Churches on Health and Healing to be operational soon after the meeting of the June 2023 WCC Central Committee. It is also only then that we shall implement the work of HIV and AIDS pandemic working group. As we move to the next phase of the HIV response, we have to pause and remember all those persons, including my own mother, who lost their lives due to lack of access to treatment, stigma, discrimination, and inequalities. It is in their honor that we keep working. We keep raising the flag of love, justice, and equality. I thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Professor, for uh, taking us through the history of WCC's involvement in the HIV response. You've highlighted the work of EHIA, the work of EAA, and you've also highlighted the challenges that we have to address as we move forward. You've noted that resources have reduced, but inequalities are widening and the uh, pandemic is still a key challenge. And thank you for reaffirming the commitment of the circle to continue responding. Now moving forward, friends, I request you to join me, uh, invite uh, our friend, Jacek uh, Siko, who is the focal person for the faith initiatives in UNAID. Jacek is indeed a source of tremendous support for the faith initiatives in the HIV response. And Jacek, we appreciate you for that. And he'll be speaking to us about the importance of the faith communities in overcoming the HIV pandemic globally. Jacek, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Brian. And thank you for a very, very nice introduction. Uh, let me start with a few remarks around, around today, around the special day of today, because as it, was mark, uh, as it was mentioned by you, we are having our today's webinar on a very special day, which is the day that commemorates uh, like those who were with us and passed away because of AIDS or because of AIDS-related diseases but also those who survived and can enjoy and commemorate with us today. So institutionally, few remarks around this. Uh, the inequalities which perpetuate the AIDS pandemic are not inevitable and we can tackle them. Today, UNAIDS is urging each of us to address the inequalities which are holding back progress in ending AIDS. 
this year slogan for the World AIDS Day, which is the Equalize, uh, is a call to action. It is a prompt for all of us to work for the proven practical actions needed to address inequalities and help end AIDS. And this includes three main elements. Increase availability, quality, and sustainability of services for HIV treatment, testing, and prevention so that everyone is well served. Second would be reform laws, policies, and practices to tackle the stigma and exclusion faced by people living with HIV and by key and marginal populations so that everyone is shown respect and is welcomed. And finally, ensuring the sharing of technology to enable equal access to the best HIV science between communities and between the global south and global north. Data from UNAIDS on the global HIV response reveals that during the last two years of COVID-19 and other global crises like the recent Russian aggression against Ukraine and its global impact, progress against the HIV pandemic has faltered, resources have shrunk, and millions of lives are at risk as a result. Four decades into the HIV response, inequalities still persist for the most basic services. And uh, we need to do something like something with this. They persist in testing treatment or condoms, but even more so for the new technologies. Young women in Africa remain disproportionately affected by HIV while coverage of dedicated programs for them remains definitely too low, far too low. For example, in 19 high burden countries in Africa, dedicated combination prevention programs for adolescent girls and young women are operating in only 40% of the high HIV incidence locations. Only a third of people in key populations have regular prevention access. Key populations fa face major legal barriers, including criminalization, discrimination, stigmatization, etc. We have only eight years left before the 2030 goal of ending AIDS as the global health threat. Economic, social, cultural, legal inequalities must be addressed as a matter of urgency. In a pandemic, inequalities exacerbate the dangers for everyone. Indeed, to end AIDS can only be achieved if we tackle the inequalities which drive it. World leaders, on one hand, need to act with bold and accountable leadership. On the other, all of us everywhere must do all. We can help tackle inequalities too. And here I'm turning to our main topic of, of, of today's discussion. Why faith partners and why specifically World Council of Churches? Like, we would not be able to tackle inequalities and any other key issues related to the epidemic without multi-stakeholder approach. What, while we do see several difficult issues to be addressed within this multi-stakeholder dialogue, I think we are all independently of our political, religious, economic, cultural interests are for the world without AIDS. And I am really proud on behalf of my organization to recognize that faith partners are part of the AIDS response from its very beginning, even before the UN AIDS was established and are very solid partners uh, for the duration of the existence of the joint program. WCC is with us for many, many years and will remain with us for the following years. And we are like highly appreciating it and we are proud of this partnership. This partnership is not only within the UNAIDS Pack for Faith Initiative, but it's much beyond. Some people who are on this call were crucial in the development of the new current new UNAIDS, even not UNAIDS, it's a global AIDS strategy. Several of you took 
active part in the negotiations around the political declaration that, that gives us the main uh, road to ending AIDS in 2030. And like it would be in, impossible to imagine that the end of the epidemic would be declared without your active participation. Special bonds that are between UNAIDS office that I am running and WCC, two programs mentioned by Professor Isabel uh, for many years of the response are providing dozens, if not hundreds of great examples of deliverables within the AIDS response, including along the lines of the current equalize slogan and campaign. So I really appreciate having opportunity to talk to you and being considered as part of your family. Thank you. Wow, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Jasek. You've been, you've done justice to to the time. Uh, I will appreciate you for basically affirming that we cannot end the pandemic unless we address the inequalities. And uh, thank you also for acknowledging the role of the multi stakeholders approach. And now uh, moving forward, I think uh, you and Prof have laid a very good foundation uh, to the next uh, presentation, which will be done by Dr. Manoj, who will be speaking about uh, um, HIV advocacy work at global and church level. Uh, Dr. Manoj, friends, is the coordinator of the WCC Ecumenical Advocacy Alliance that Prof mentioned earlier on, and he is a medical doctor. So Dr. take the floor, please. Yes. 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 So I, I just wanted to um, uh, uh, just go through the uh, you know uh, uh, give you a, a little bit of a, a background of the HIV work uh, in faith communities and and international work uh, that has been happening in WCC. Uh, uh, Dr. Isabel actually shared about the history. So you know the the work started as early as 1980 uh, 80, 84. So, because when the uh, the 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 the, uh, the, the uh, Christian Medical Commission was formed in 1968, by 1974 they 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 started to have a formal relationship with the World Health Organization. So, about ten years afterwards, uh, nine years after that, the WHO actually reached out to uh, WCC colleagues and said, "We have a new disease in 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 uh, which we are seeing." called HIV. Can you help us? Because we find that the faith communities are actually uh, creating a big challenge in different parts of the world. And that's how uh, the work started in 1984. So, you know, you see from the very beginning. And then uh, I just wanted to say that the basis of the ecumenical work, when we look through the, uh, th through the last 40 years, has been based on uh, various, uh, uh, these three pillars. One is compassion and care. Uh, indicative of love, competence and courage, indicative of knowledge and action, and coherence and connectedness, which is indicative of working together. Now, in 1984, uh, the, 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 it, 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 we formed uh, actually, a, a, they formed a, a group to, uh, to discuss on these issues. And the executive committee actually discussed uh, in 1986 in, in, in Reykjavik the outcome of the Geneva consultation in 1980s, June 1986. It is amazing to see the basis of that international work where they said the AIDS crisis challenges us profoundly to be the church in deed and in truth, to be the church as a healing community. AIDS is heartbreaking and challenging the churches to break their own hearts, to repent of inactivity and of rigid moralisms. Since AIDS cuts across race, class, gender, age, sexual orientation, and sexual expression, it challenges our fears and exclusion. The healing community itself will need to be healed by forgiveness of Christ. And they went on, the executive committee also wished to call to the attention of the churches these further concerns expressed by the consultation to confess that the churches as institutions have been slow to speak and to act and that Christians have been quick to judge and condemn many of the people who have fallen prey to the disease. And then goes on to affirm 
support the entire medical and research community, and of course, to affirm that God's love that deals with us in love and mercy, and therefore are freed from simplistic moralization about those who are attacked by the virus. Imagine this was what the churches said. And for you to, uh, to inform that the faith communities have been doing a lot of great work, have been doing a lot of great work. The gospel itself is called good news. But what happens is the bad news or the bad, uh, uh, the voices capture a lot of attention. So, the, but huge amounts of good work and good news has been done by faith communities. So, when we look into the, uh, the, 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 the that consultation in 1986, they called on church, churches to focus on pastoral care, education and prevention, and social ministry. This was the time when there was no treatment. So, between 1984 to 1994, we were burying people. We were, we were seeing people suffer and die. So what came out in those days in that advocacy and, and, and not only advocacy, but also the work of WCC was quickly to realize that HIV is not something that is focusing or happening just in one country because the concerns were raised from two countries, from Democratic Republic Zaire in those days, DRC in, and, and, and the United States. But it was quickly realized it was a global problem. And so by 19, uh, in 80, 88, 89, small booklets, and this booklet, a manual for pastors came out. And by 1989, 90, guide for HIV AIDS pastoral counseling came out. And then they also produced confronting AIDS together, participatory methodology on addressing HIV. So this was actually listening to communities and how communities were actually healing communities, taking examples from the ground. So this publication shows you that. So, and then in 1990s, uh, what in 1994 to 97, a systematic study was was uh, was uh, commissioned by the Central Committee, and by 1996, they came out with a very powerful study called The Challenge, The Church's Response, and this led to a 1996 uh, detailed statement. And what followed uh, was a, a study document facing AIDS in the context, education in the context of vulnerability, which was used internationally. And in 1999, we got sub WCC got support from UNAIDS to actually implement this. And what also came out uh, is, is the issue of women and HIV. So 1995 in the Beijing summit, WCC and the ecumenical movement tried to bring a group of women living with HIV to Beijing. But the government at the time prevented people living from HIV to come to Beijing. And that led to the uh, De New Delhi consultation in 1995 and led to various contact magazine publications on HIV and HIV and women. And this publication, Love in the Time of HIV, Women's Health and Challenges of HIV. So you see till 1999, the issues were raised internationally through the lifting up the good examples from the uh, from the HI HIV work uh, across the member churches, what what we see following was that we uh, the it was clear that it is not enough uh, that we can that we do just work globally. Then what happened was the. Uh, the UN AIDS became, uh, we started to have the United Nations a General Assembly, UNGAS. So WCC started to send delegations from the first UNGAS in 2000. The first UNGAS, the, the delegation was led by uh, uh, Canon Gideon, uh, but he became sick and his place was taken by, uh, uh, by Christoph Ben. So the presence in UNGAS and international conferences started to be there. Un the campaign for universal access to treatment was, was became very clear. Interfaith work became clear. And we also started to work on children and HIV. So in that process, we, we see the formation of the EHIA, which helped WCC to address and assist churches on the ground with its five regional offices in Africa specifically. And then of course, as you heard, it went on abroad and internationally, but also the EAA was formed in 2000, where, which helped in advocacy internationally. Uh, 
So this is a very clear uh, role uh, that WCC has and the ecumenical movement did. Clearly, advocacy rising from the very international top level down to the grassroots. And to identify uh, the AIDS epidemic, uh, pandemic helped us to deal with universal access, helped us to deal with stigma and discrimination, helped us to deal with, with uh, interfaith work. So what is amazing is that the interfaith work and all these things became, we became very proficient. And during the International AIDS Conference, the ecumenical movement did the pre-conferences uh, and brought together faiths in a very uh, participatory and inclusive manner. And the other international work that we, uh, what we see is also bringing the voices and lives and concerns of people living in the HIV and those who are vulnerable to HIV. By 2005, we see the, the, the creation of workplace policies and clear documentation and guidelines on partnership between churches and people living with HIV AIDS organizations. And of course, it also manifested in walking alongside in the creation and the nurturing of NRLA plus and NRLA plus. So I, I just summarized uh, to you uh, some of the advocacy and the and the work of the uh, uh, of the ecumenical movement through these years, and what we see that it came out of uh, the, the 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 CMC, and now we are coming into a situation where we have to consolidate under an umbrella of HIV. But to show, to remind you that the HIV work has been there from the very beginning of the pandemic. And we are uh, we are uh, very glad that they, after the assembly, that our governance has clearly showed us that we need to continue uh, work with the pandemic in spite of these various other challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Manoj. You've given us a wealth uh, of history and of experience for all uh, the HIV work done in WCC, giving us an account uh, right from uh, 1984 to where we are. So thank you so much. And now that we've heard from you on behalf of EAA, I would also love to invite uh, uh, our friend, uh, Gracia Ross Violeta, uh, who is a Bolivian advocate openly living with HIV for the last 22 years. Gracia is now leading the Chimen Core HIV and AIDS initiatives and advocacy. And she's going to present about the WCC work in the different regions and the way forward. And as Gracia presents, I'm reminding you, please, if you have questions or comments, post them in the chat uh, so that they can be responded to. Gracia, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Good. Uh, evening, good morning. So I'm going to explain a little bit of specifically the work that WCC has been doing in, in, in Africa. The next one. Um, so particularly the ecumenical HIV and AIDS initiatives and advocacy, we call it EHIA, which has the mission to empower the faith community in order to make it competent for the HIV response. This initiative started in 2002 in response, in response to the demand of churches in Africa. But in 2013, uh, in uh, an assembly of the World Council of Churches, it received a mandate to expand beyond Africa because the strategies were so good. And, um, Currently, this program has five offices in Africa, Togo, Kenya, DRC, Zimbabwe, and Angola. The next one, please. So what strategies were used in this uh, initiative? These are like the best strategies, but not all of them, because it has been like 20 years of this initiative. First of all, the contextual Bible studies in which the analysis of the Bible texts are used for a better response to the HIV epidemic, intergenerational conversation in which pastors and faith leaders have a conversation with young people and talk about the, the issues that are difficult, sex, sexuality, relationships, etc. But also these conversations that are safer with communities that are vulnerable. And in some cases, those included, for example, 
uh, internally displaced people and sex workers, but also the production of theological manuals and toolkits in order to educate the faith community and doing a lot of trainings with the pastors so that they can train their peers. And of course, the promotion of the Thursdays in Black campaign, which is a campaign that the World Council of Churches holds uh, every Thursday to mark uh, the impact of gender-based, sexual gender-based violence and how it is affecting women and girls. In the last years, uh, the HIA program has responded to mental health and COVID-19 situations just because people came to ask uh, our colleagues, you know, what can we do about this new uh, pandemic? And our colleagues responded immediately. Next one. So what other work we did in other regions? Well, uh, in 2015, 2016, some activities were conducted in Jamaica, Myanmar, Philippines, and Ukraine. These were not able to continue because of lack of funding. Uh, this year, uh, with the support of UNAIDS, we implemented a, a project which is called a strategic engagement of civil society networks and faith actors. And we uh, conducted consultations that we call AIDS Back on the Agenda because we realized that HIV is falling off from the agenda, the development agenda. So we reconnected or connected uh, faith communities with the um, networks of people living with HIV and key affected populations. We also brought the Global Fund implementers and the representatives in the country coordination mechanisms and also the ministries of health. And in these uh, consultations, it was it, there was an analysis of the response and the gaps. And the main purpose was to see <coughs> how the faith sector can yes, collaborate sure. in order to achieve this uh, response to HIV in those particular countries. So those were India, Dominican Republic, Indonesia, and Jamaica. We picked those countries because they are middle income and uh, not always seen as a priority in the global scenario. Next one. So what is the way forward for HIV in the World Council of Churches? Well, in February this year, the governing bodies of the World Council of Churches instructed to establish the Commission of the Churches on Health and Healing. And HIV will be inside this commission in a working group under the name HIV wow. and pandemics. Up to 20 people will be appointed as commissioners and at least one of them shall be living with HIV or any other chronic disease. The guidance of the bylaws of this uh, health commission says that we will have participation of member churches, uh, the members of the international network of religious leaders that are living with HIV or are personally affected, members of the Ecumenical Disability Advocates Network and others that you can see in this list. Um, we still don't know who these people will be. We expect to have them by maybe uh, mid-year next year. Next one, please. How this health commission is going to work? Well, it will have three main areas of work. One of them will be advocacy. The second one will be charge engagement. And the third one will be service delivery. And on, on, on the lower part of the slide, you can see the strategies that will be used, theological reflection, research and documentation, training and accompaniment, and communication and networking. And in the lower part, there, there says key issues. This means that HIV will be there and maybe the commissioners will put COVID-19 or cancer or uh, MPOX, I don't really know, uh, but uh, I, I, I guess 10 key issues on health uh, is a good number to just start working. It's already too much. Next one. Now, I wanted to explain a little bit about the concept of health in the World Council of Churches because People living with HIV, like myself, we always say that, that HIV is not just a health issue. This is something that you cannot solve with a medication because it's related to inequalities, to gender-based violence. So it is important that we go back to the concept of health that is used in the World Council of, of Churches. So for us, health is a dynamic state of well-being of the individual and the society. It is physical, mental, spiritual, economic, political 
and social well-being, of being in harmony with each other, with the material world and with God. But health is also an issue of justice, of peace, of the integrity of creation, of spirituality, personhood, community, and it's a systemic issue. And the last one. We also bring the concept of healing, which for us is not just cure, but also healing, which we see as a process towards health and wholeness. And we say that healing embraces what God has achieved for human beings through the incarnation of Jesus Christ. God's gifts of healing are occasionally experienced instantly or rapidly, but in most cases, it's a gradual process taking time to bring deep restoration to health at more than one level. Like for example, in my case, I always say that I have been healed with HIV. Yeah, God healed me from my previous way of life and he gave me HIV as a healing methodology for that. So for us, healing is something that is physical, mental, social, and spiritual. And no disease is confined only to one of these spheres, but it's in its causes or effects. And so healing should be always holistic. So this is the, these are the concepts that we are going to use. Uh, we expect to have the names of the commissioners uh, as soon as possible next year and start working with them. Uh, we know that there will be young people and we know that not everyone will be a medical doctor because that was instructed by the bylaws of the health commission. So when we have the health commission composed and the HIV and pandemics, uh, working group composed, we are also going to give you uh, new updates. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, Gracia, you've um, uh, taken us through the work that uh, AI has done uh, in Africa, but also in other parts of the world. Uh, we're excited to hear about uh, the formation of the Commission on Health and Healing. And thank you also for articulating for us very well the concept of faith and healing that will be uh, applied uh, within that commission. And thank you for emphasizing that there will be young people within the commission. That's very important. Thank you so much. So friends, we have about um, 15 minutes of, of interruption if you have a question or a comment. Uh, there is a question that I've seen from Stuart. Uh, he's inquiring, what do you think are the challenges currently faced by faith communities and how can WCC best meet uh, their needs in the future? I'll invite uh, Manoj uh, uh, to respond and then also I'll give it to, uh, to, to Jasik uh, uh, to, to say a word on the same as I wait for more questions to pop on the chat. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Stuart, for the question. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and thank you, Gracia, to guide us through the process, uh, you know, what we are looking forward. But just to also to just mention that, you know, the there is a process and, and the church churches can suggest, member churches can suggest, uh, you know, members for the commission. And we will give you more details. And of course, also when the working groups are made, they, that working group can also have a possibility of expanding. And there are some clear indications uh, of some working groups, bioethics and uh, mental health and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, trauma healing. Uh, food and nutrition. So these are some ideas apart from HIV. HIV will be a clear working group. Now this challenge, uh, uh, Stuart, uh, you know, the, what we've seen, you know, what have been, you know, even from the HIV perspective, people have been such a struggling with conflicts, climate ch challenges, and from COVID. So it's very interesting that from our, from the WCC, the, 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 uh, the, 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 Public witness and diaconia is the, you know, there are two facets of the church's work. One is, what, what are you as a Christian? So that's one side. On the other side of the coin is, so if you're a Christian, what do you do? So public witness and diaconia is actually what we do. And actually there are now, the, the assembly has asked us to form work under three commissions. One is on climate justice, the other is on inter, international affairs, and the other is health. So actually, the, the the conflicts and international instability, instability is one of the big challenges. The other is the climate crisis, and the other is pandemics and health crisis. So 
you know, so, so when we say these issues are all interconnected, but why we want to keep HIV as a clear issue is that, you know, we don't, you know, like for example, you know, Kale Almadal who passed away, he was, he was actually, you know, the, the person from UNAIDS, uh, vocal person who was one of our advisors, he, he passed on. He used to say, when you have a soup, have, don't have a blended soup, soup, have the soup with the vegetable pieces. So in a sense, we are dealing with this, we are, we are addressing holistically, but we don't want to lose the specificities. So when we are working with HIV, we are going to work on the issue, but we don't want to focus be disconnected from the issues of gender, the issues of climate issues, the conflict, violence against women. So we are hoping that in this new style of functioning, there will be clear staff members who are tasked to do work on HIV and the intersectionalities, but they're working in a climate of interconnectedness. So I think you raised the, <laughs> the challenges true, but I think we have to struggle with this together. And this is why we look forward to, to your guidance. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, yes, Jasek, on the same. Yes, yes, on the same. Thank you. Well, Manoj actually answered quite well because there is, you know, there is this global aspect, global environment, uh, which is not only environment or health, but it is you know, like it, these are conflicts, these are uh, natural disaster, these are humanitarian crises, etc., etc. Et et I was mentioning the, you know, the. Russian aggression against Ukraine, we do not know yet today the impact for the global response, yeah, because it is still in, in progress, unfortunately, even if we pray for, 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 for the end every day. Uh, but there is also this, like this, uh, like scale of the front line, I would call it for myself, yes, where WCC has a very specific role and is fulfilling this role around the areas that are mentioned, around, like uh, uh, Violetta was giving very specific concrete examples of activities that the organization was and, uh, and is conducting in several places around the world globe. Yeah, let me come with an example of faith healing, for example, yes? Faith healing that within the AIDS response, response is bringing a lot of harm from the point of view of people leaving treatment vis-a-vis -vis World Council of Churches and their partners' activities of providing people at risk evidence yeah, that faith healing is not against the Bible, is not against the faith, it, it, it is not against the religion, it's actually very much in line with, with what God wants to do us, uh, us to do. So, you know, like, I would see the role as, as Stuart is asking, WCC best meet their needs in future. I would see the continuous role of WCC in providing evidence data to their partners and, and communities at country level, at local level, as close as possible to people in need that they know what is the situation and they pr uh, uh, appropriately adapt to this situation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jacek. Uh, now I have two questions that I will uh, give to, I'll give one to uh, Professor Isabel and one to Gracia very briefly. So Prof, a question from uh, Adira Godfrey. Are there interfaith dialogues in the HIV response and what are some of the best practices so far? If you could respond in one, two minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, my, my response is connected to the overall approach of working in the WCC, in that he, in everything that we are doing, we say interfaith dialogue is very important because when you're dealing with HIV, it's not a Christian issue. It's not a Muslim issue or a Hindu issue. It's a human problem and it requires you know, all the faiths to come together to respond to these issues. So that's a general approach of the WCC, not only for HIV, but even for climate change, for political issues, in everything, we believe very strongly in inter-religious approach. 
Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, you've said HIV has no religion. That's key uh, for us to, to note. And now to uh, Gracia, still from Adira. Uh, how do we navigate the stereotypes around condom use that are largely popular in uh, uh, and most faith communities today? Yeah, uh, what I have seen in Dominican Republic is, you know, uh, a leader of the evangelical church. These are not members of the World Council of Churches and uh, rather they are very, very conservative. And they said, we have changed over these years. We have changed and we are here we want to help, even in things that are distributing, informing people about condoms. Uh, this is not the only way we have to prevent HIV now. We know uh, because of the data that the World Health Organization provided that treatment is prevention. The sooner we get people with HIV on treatment, the better we will be in prevention because we will control the viral load of uh, the community. But also bringing this focus of HIV prevention as a holistic thing. HIV prevention is not just condom. It's, it's fighting against violence against women. It's making uh, communities more uh, fair for people who are in poverty and or suffering violence. I think bringing this approach will help people to move away from this discussion, you know, condom, yes or no, no. Because sometimes we don't even need to discuss about condom. We need to discuss about many structural things that do a lot in terms of preventing HIV or, or making it uh, more vulnerable or making communities more vulnerable. So that I would say about condom. But it seems to me that the faith communities have grown over the years and they are more ready to, to talk about this. I have even met uh, a group of uh, Muslim leaders in India who are working with gay men. Can you believe that? But that's happening right now. So this is an amazing progress, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Gracia. Um, David Abastos bringing to our attention that PEPFA has reemphasized the importance of faith communities in the HIV response. And he thinks that WCC could be a strong partner, especially with active involvement uh, with the uh, local faith communities. However, there is a question that has come from two uh, people, two questions, but I think it is one. So I'll summarize them in one question from Esther Mahumi and uh, Samuel Munyuri. Uh, it's about young people. We know that uh, basically now in Eastern and Southern Africa, uh, the news around the new HIV infections among young people, 14 to 25 years, is, is, is alarming, you know new infections and at a very high rate. So they're inquiring, what is WCC uh, doing to reach this particular category of young people? I'll give each of us uh, 30, 30 you know, seconds, the five of us so that to respond to that, and then we shall bring our session to a closure. But because Jacek put up his hand, he will use a minute. So Jacek, go first. Yeah, as an observer for WCC, I should say that you know, WCC is investing in young people and you know, like, like definitely Violetta is an example of this. Uh, but but you know, like I think responding to very key issues that Esther and and uh, Reverend Sam are bringing, we cannot do it without young people themselves. Mm -hmm. So we should continue uh, like bringing them closer and interface as an example interface health platform that WCC is one of very active members of is making an effort to create a forum of permanent dialogue between religious leaders and young people. So I hope that we will have a tool, one tool is not enough, obviously, but we will have a tool that will help us to address these issues. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jacek. Yes, Prof. I want to give another example of the work that the WCC Ehia has done uh, together with UNESCO, they produced a curriculum to be used in schools in order to promote sex education. Because at the end of the day, the issue is silence about uh, sex education. But we need to open up avenues where parents can discuss these issues with their children 
without feeling embarrassed about it. And then teachers, you know, providing appropriate information on sex education. And we, we want good information to be out there, other than, you know, allowing the children to go on the internet and find information about sex, which is uh, not usually the right information for their particular age. So education is very important and WCC is investing in curriculum on sex education. Thank you, Prof. Yes, Manoj, 30 seconds, please. Yes, I mean, I just uh, thank you, Brian. I mean, your presence here as a moderator itself is an example of WCC's yes. policy. Uh, Brian is uh, representing, he's a member of our board, the executive committee. He, he, he was mentored uh, as a young person, you know, mm -hmm. in their higher work in, and he is studying his theology, and he was sent by his church in Church of Uganda mm -hmm. to this to, as a as a delegate, and he was selected in the Central Committee, and he is part of our board. He is one of our bosses. So you know what the, the idea is actually: young people need to come to the leadership, and 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 when we say as as the, today the International Aid Society Executive Director said. It is not that young people are hard to reach. It is sometimes the service provision that is hard to reach. So we have to make sure that we are embracing and 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 welcoming. And so you know the COVID pandemic has taught us that we need young people, and young people have actually gained a lot of of of, of entrance and prominence in helping us navigate in these difficult times. And this should continue. And 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 we need your guidance and we need your challenge uh, as as we are here serving you as colleagues. And but you know, WCC is a space, is your space, and you need to bring up and you your examples are going to be lifted up. And then we need young people in each of your churches. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Manoj. Uh, over to you, Gracia. Thirty seconds, or even less. <laughs> well. Uh, I just put it on the chat, you know, that WCC is also part of a global uh, of global efforts that are aimed only to reduce the impact of HIV among children and eliminate completely mother to child transmission. This is an effort with PEPFAR, with UNAIDS and with other actors, uh, UNITAID as well is there. So this is very important, you know, and for the world, it's a shame that we are still seeing uh, children born with HIV with yeah. all the tools that we have now. Thank you. Thank you, Gracia. Uh, friends, there is just one more question that I'll love us to address and I request us to give us just uh, three minutes so that uh, we can finish within that time. I'll find this question to Professor Isabel and request her to use just 30 seconds. Uh, how is WCC dealing with uh, issues of key populations and minorities? in its approach to addressing inequalities. Yeah, um, from the section that he, uh, Dr. Manoj Kurian quoted at the beginning, it was very clear from the beginning that he, if the churches are to respond to issues of uh, HIV, they need to deal with all the key populations. This is a difficult issue, but he, the acknowledgement is there. And I would say um, that he, one of the biggest achievements of the WCC at the moment has been the production of um, a document, which is a um, conversation on the pilgrim way. It's on human sexuality, okay? Broad description of human sexuality. This opens up opportunities you know, for conversation about how to work with the key populations, you know, within the uh, the work of HIV, it's addressing everyone uh, who is affected, you know, by HIV. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Uh, thank you so much, uh, our dear facilitators, uh, for the great uh, work done. Thank you, friends, for joining this discussion. I wish we could go on for the next three hours, uh, but I understand uh, our friends like Russia have been running the whole day, so <laughs> they may not be able to, uh, uh, to read that, but 
we have had a successful webinar. We have heard about what WCC has been doing in the HIV response since 1984 with the Ecumenical HIV and AIDS Initiatives and Advocacy, uh, the Ecumenical Advocacy Alliance, and with other partners. We have heard about the tremendous lessons and experiences that uh, come from this work. We have also heard about the challenges in the HIV pandemic that uh, force us to update our strategies. We have heard about the uh, WCC Health Commission and how HIV work will be uh, incorporated within it. Now, as we draw to the conclusion, I would like to share with you something. I was born just three years to the end of the 20th century. And uh, if, my if mathematics does not fail me, I happen to be one of the young people who have no experience of a life in a world without HIV. Mm. However, I have learned from my history classes for the past two years that once upon a time, this world was free of HIV and AIDS. Mm. History repeats itself. I've been told since I was a child, and indeed, every day, I dream of the day, the history of a world without HIV and AIDS will repeat itself. And continue to pray that when this happens, the history of humanity suffering from this pandemic will never repeat itself. As a member of the executive committee, I really congratulate WCC for this work that has been done in the HIV response that we have had. I thank you, Nate, and all other partners who have made it possible. And it is indeed my prayer that we don't give up now. We have done a lot. If Paul was in this webinar, he would have said, we have fought a good fight, but the race is not yet over. Mm. And so we must keep the faith and continue responding to this pandemic. So we should continue being on the side of people living with HIV and the most vulnerable communities until when we achieve my dream, which I think is also a dream of a world without HIV and AIDS. So in conclusion, friends, on this World AIDS Day, we commemorate the historical contribution of the faith sector to the HIV response, but we also need to reflect on the lessons learned as you have heard them and determined to carry on the work for the next phase of the response. Remember the inequalities that continue to drive the pandemic. And I hope you're inspired by the statement from Jasek that if you want to end the pandemic, we must end the inequalities. And at the same time, we have to be agile to adapt to the new challenges such as the COVID-19 and other pandemics. So in this reality, friends, I invite you all to join me in this prayer as we close. Let's pray. Dear God, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the work that faith communities did in the HIV response. Thank you for opening our understanding to acknowledge the inequalities that put communities in a vulnerable situation. May we never get tired of being on the side of justice and mercy. May we have the strength to keep this fight until when there is a cure for HIV. Make us channels of hope and reconciliation. Help us, Lord, being part of your healing hands for a broken world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.